big welcome to Kay Breezy. Hey. Good, man. Could have done those side bends. Well, they're a bit long. Man, this is, this is, this is, a, lock, long. This is a lockdown lid that's just growing out. Unlike you, Very mate, fast on the side. My, my hair still grows. Remember, someone's looking quite strong at the moment. Hey, let's go back. Like, you're the one person I generally look at photos of when you first signed for Extra Chiefs, and you genuinely look like a different man. It's weird, isn't it? It is weird because I, I think it, it could easily be. I think you could be a fraud, and I think you're probably a competition winner, <laughs> and you've just taken this guy's place. <laughs> you're like a pastry chef who's just taken the place of Phil, the real Phil Dolman, <laughs> who's somewhere. He's probably out there somewhere, the real Phil Dolman. He might be. Still playing some good rugger. Let's talk about let's talk about your body initially. How is the body faring up? Body's fine, mate. It's absolutely fine. Um, I haven't had to do a lot of rugby, really. To be fair, I've been training a bit. I've had a couple of games here and there, so keep fresh. Yeah, it's nice had, and easy like that. You've had to bash in a couple of, a couple of back to back games, eighty minutes. Yeah, that was that was tough last week. Irish into eighty minutes against Irish into eighty minutes against. Who else did we play? Um, Bristol. And now nah, we played Irish into uh, Wasps. Sorry, sorry, is it? Uh, Wasps. No, nah, Irish into Wasps. Two eighty minutes in four days. I haven't done that since I was at university. So that was tough. That was tough. But I've recovered all right. I got a bit of a sore shoulder from one of the games um, where young Tom Wyatt decided to get a bit of cramp. So instead of me getting clapped off, you know, last game ever at the Chiefs probably. Young Tom White walked, limped off with cramp. So I went on the wing, hurt my shoulder, and there we are, sore shoulder. Yeah, I mean, no one likes a hurty shoulder either. And for someone who, who, you know, notorious for being in the big hitters club with the likes of myself, not so much Gareth, but, um, you know, it's a tough one to take, isn't it? It is tough, mate, it is. I mean, no, oh, still is going to get back in. Gareth, I'm back here, mate. I'm here, mate. I'm here. I'm just hearing you give me bad manners oh, about shoulders. Shit, I'm looking at you. I'm looking at you, and all you've got is brown snake shoulders. So don't give us any. <laughs> <idea. laughs> you talking about big hits? Like yeah, that's exactly the time to bring me in, big hitter. Like uh, major shoulder hey, reconstruction on that puppy, mate. Is it? Yeah, genuine, genuine. Is that why it's sticking away out? Is it? Most of me would have had to retire from that bad boy, but I think I'd have been another ten yeah. years, mate. Easily. Um, Stina, how's the body? Uh, okay, okay, I would say. Uh, I've shifted quite a bit of weight, which has been good. You played about three minutes, mm -hmm. didn't you? I'm oh, from the other day? Yeah. yeah, mate, yeah. 15 minutes is good for me. It's grand. Yeah. Um, and um, you, you boys are obviously both uh, retirement on the, on the horizon. Um, I was just speaking to Dolly then about casting minds back to... Um, memories from your first arrival at the club? Do you have any sort of standouts? Because there's obviously, the, the, the club has completely transformed in so many different elements and evolved so much. But your kind of standout memories of first arriving at Sandy Park back then, we'll start with I you. can remember, oh, well, I, I don't know if you're saying it to me. I can remember my very first day. I can remember walking in and uh, being straight in with Paddy Anson taking me to one side and it, I was putting the scales, I was weighed, and then I was, um, they took the volley fat off me. And I was told I was 10.5 in body fat. At that time, I don't really understand it. But if you were over 10, you were in fat club. So I was straight in and everyone thought I was a hooker. And uh, that didn't really bode well. And I remember being brought in and put on to uh, a what? It wasn't a what bike, it was a spin bike. And I was told to keep cycling while the lads went and trained. So that was my first memory of coming in a chase, <laughs> which wasn't Come great on. fun. Fat burning. How about you feel? That, that must have been a fat burning for you, surely, mate. Oh, well, yeah, I, think I, was, I was, I was going to say, I've never been under 10, I don't think. Not once. <laughs> <laughs> Paddy Hansen was still here. I'd still be in Fat Club. Um, now, I remember, I, I remember the first day, which included our M fits or something like that, wasn't it? The four, mm. the the four tests we did. Did you do that, Kay? Yeah. No, I've done it before, mate. I've been around since the age of time. That was horrible. Um, I also remember putting my bag in Bentos's spot and he took great pleasure in kicking it off and getting rid of my stuff and chucking it out in the corridor because I'd put it in his in the wrong place. 
What a uh, which which grinds my gears. I wish I had gone in and chucked his gear, you know, chucked his gear in the ice bath. But there we are. I was young, new to the new to the environment, so I didn't want to ruffle too many feathers. Yeah, yeah, new to the environment. Also, you know, moonlighting as a pastry chef on a bit of a competition winner. <laughs> That you kind of done all right. <laughs> so, done all right. Done all right. That play lasted the, the test of time. Um, how's the, from a culture point of view, how has the culture evolved from a squad? And it's, it's quite tricky to kind of look back then because when you're in the moment, it, you kind of, it just naturally evolves in front of you, doesn't it? But have you got any, any memories, Phil, about how that kind of culture was then and how it's kind of evolved? Yeah, as, um, I'd say we were a lot less serious about our rugby back then. Probably a little bit more serious about getting getting drunk on the weekend. Um, I think, you know, the culture of the club has always been quite a tight knit club, as in terms of the squad, um, and we've had a good group of lads. But I think the the switch has been over the years where we've kind of gone from a side that is win or lose on the booze to a side that you know trying to win at all costs, yet still enjoying each other's company. Yeah. Yeah, very much like, just make sure you win every game and then you can get on the booze. Exactly. Then you can enjoy each other's company. If you lose, you can't. Yeah, 100%. How about you, Stino? <laughs> yeah, so it's a similar message, Phil, isn't it? I suppose uh, when we first came, I suppose when you were in the championship as well, we had such a big group of guys and winning was kind of normal because um, we were a top two team, really, and that, and you go out and you'd win. You'd win by 30, 40 points at times. And it was, you know, we're going to play this week. And we're going to play a match. We're going to win. And then we're going to have a few beers. That kind of probably would change when everyone was the Prem. It was like, right, we're going to go enjoy, get better after we've played a couple of games. But we're still going to have that culture of having a few beers on the way home. And it's probably, it's still there to the point now because there was an enjoyment factor because we were brand new into the Premiership. Everything was brand new. So it was obviously going to be, exciting and fun and even when you lost it was kind of like oh that was a new experience and it was great whereas now like Phil sort of said now the difference being that uh, we're more of a team that goes and wins games and we're expecting now to win games again and um, that I suppose is only a good thing going forward and plus where things are now it's harder to recover from games maybe it's because of our age I don't know but um, it is the, the games are faster they're phys, more physical than what it was even 10 years ago so um, it's probably need to not go on the booze every single weekend Do you have any looking back and I often think about this because it's like an evolution of um, it's all you don't kind of enter the premiership and then go yeah we're going we're gonna to win this this season do you? You, know, you, know, you know your first you know our first few seasons in the premiership wasn't you know we didn't talk about um, we didn't set ourselves too many targets about how we, you know, to finishing top four, finishing top six, as a lot of people kind of do. Was there, was there like big moments where you thought that created like the innate belief that we're, we're good enough to go and achieve big things? Was there a big moment? I know I, I've got a, a couple of big moments in my head that I think were, were key, but just be interesting to get your take. I think me personally, um, having never played in the Premiership before that, game obviously we played Gloucester and we won the first game but there's a lot of emotion with that the one what really set me up was the week after we went to Leicester and we did a lot of damage to Leicester and that was when Leicester were right at the top of their game but because we'd never experienced playing away from home in the Premiership to, to I know we lost the game but we actually came away from it and we'd played well and we competed and I think that gives that group of guys a massive load of confidence because a lot of guys had never played Premiership rugby before at that point. So obviously at that stage, everyone was telling us, you're going to get relegated. You're going back down again. Enjoy yourselves. You're gone. And then all of a sudden we finish eighth in the league. I have no doubt the start that we had to that year um, gave the guys a lot of confidence. Now that's a different kind of thing as you move forward and you move forward about talking about two, three years down the line winning the LV Cups and stuff. But at that very moment, that was a real... To me, that showed that this club was going to stay stay strong and it keep using the same culture and vibe that it had that it's going to springboard itself going forward. Phil, um, if, so if we, if we sort of go forward to the start of the 2016-17 uh, uh, season, um, so the, the previous season we'd, we'd lost to um, Saris in the final, um, and then... Talk us, talk us through the start of that very next season because it kind of didn't it didn't start how we kind of anticipated. 
No, it didn't, did it? Um, I'm trying to think. Wasn't that long ago? I can't think back that far. I know. Um, I don't know. I maybe because I was injured or something. Is it? I think I was injured, so we started pretty Sunday. poorly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think. I think it's look. We, we've. I I don't think we ever really panicked as a squad that you know we were we were going to be bottom of the table and battling for everything we we you know for the survival. But I think it was a bit of a realization call. I think from the year before that okay we thought we'd probably. We'd, we'd arrived as one of the top clubs, yet I think every other club in the in the league probably thought, well, we can take a chunk out of these boys, and they did for that first part of the season. Um, I think we've developed that kind of hard edge about us over those years from 2016 onwards, where we are one of those top sides. And then I think I remember Rob's kind of saying, we need to be the aggressive. We need to be the aggressors in these games, where people are looking at us as a top-notch side. They want to take. They want to take a hit at us, take a shot at us, try and take us down, and and it's a good feeling that you know when you see the likes of London Irish beating us this year and Wasps the way those those teams celebrate beating us. Um, whereas in the early years in the Premiership, it was it was an expect you know it was expected of teams to beat us. Now they are you know thrilled to be getting any kind of result against us, and I think that 2016 was a bit of a realization of right, okay, we we can do it. But let's not forget what it took to get us where we were. And we quickly kind of sat down, had those tough meetings and talked about what it, what it takes to be a good Exeter Chief and be a good Exeter Chiefs team. I remember we had, so we, we finished flying high. We were patting ourselves in the back. We'd lost in a, in a, in a premiership final against Saris in 2016. Yeah, we probably hadn't done ourselves due justice, but just as, but a hell of a season. And we kind of rolled into 2016. And I think, the mindset was probably one where we thought it was just going to unfold for us again. Um, Stina, what was your take? Because we actually started that season. You know, it's 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 easily forgotten the start of that season because um, you know, because of the run we went on, that sort of record-breaking run of wins. But the, the first sort of seven games, we had an absolute stink, didn't we? Yeah, it was awful, absolutely awful. No, you're right. I think um, even when we came back in the pre-season, there was still that sort of buzz we celebrated. Um, you know, as we normally do at the end of the end of the year, we celebrated that at the end of season as if we had achieved something huge, which in the grand scheme of things was it was great to be in a final. But when you've got to win finals, really, um, and we didn't do anything really, um, and then we got into those few games, and we kind of just like you said, we kind of we chopped and changed a few things. We tried things that were a wee bit different, maybe. Um, um, I'm not saying that as well. Teams probably looked at us differently as well. Like, like like Phil's saying, you know, people were coming after us a bit more and we probably weren't ready for teams to come after us the way they came after us. They didn't come after us basically before that. So I think it was a combination of those sort of things. And then I remember whenever we played Clement, we got absolutely hiding um, at home, um, which was really embarrassing, really, um, to concede the way we did. And I remember I remember going into the coach's office straight after the game with Kitten all still on, with Jeff Parling and um, a few of the leaders went in. And we sat down. We had a real bit of a ding dong sort of conversation with them because we were we weren't happy with how things were going as a group, and I know the coaching staff weren't happy with how things were going from their perspective. And yes, like Phil said, there was a few um, very open and honest conversations. And I think we played um, Bath the next week and lost it again, um, maybe potentially. Um, but once we got that first win, I think we went then we're going like 16, 17 games unbeaten, which showed what we could do. And we kind of just simplified it for ourselves and just said we'll take another, you know, each week as it came. And that's probably what stood us in good stead going into the rest of the season. I think it did. I think we, I think we kind of, from memory, we're, that, the turning point was the Claremont game for me because it, I don't think we felt that low. And I remember we had a big players meeting where we kind of thrashed out a lot of things and just kind of said to ourselves, look, we're overcomplicating so many areas of what we're doing. Let's get back to the pure basics of what's in front of us and, and what we can actually max out on. And we started, we started to deliver that. And I remember Rob showed a video, uh, I think it was um, on your point, Phil, of a silverback gorilla. And how does, he, how, how, does he, how does he stay at the top, the silverback? Does he kind of, does he just let people keep taking bites at them? Or does he, get, does, does he go after them? And it was quite a, I mean, was, he showed some great videos, doesn't he? But it, I, I remember it being quite a big moment where actually, like, you, you don't really think about how other teams perceive you at that stage. You're kind of on your own sort of bubble sort of ticking over, aren't you? And actually, when you shift your mindset like we did, 
to then suddenly get one in and then go, yeah, we're on one here. And then we went on this extraordinary run, didn't we? And um, it leads to my next point, that's sort of that semi-final, Phil. What's your memories of leading to the semi-final? Because it kind of, it, it was almost written in the stars that we should have Sarri's at, at home at our place. That it, if, if, we, if we were going to do that, an informed Sarri's team, we just seem to have, have a belief that they're having it. Yeah, it's, um, really up and down kind of game. I remember, I think I came off with about 10, 15 minutes to go. Um, Slady came on and I think we were, it was a tight game, obviously, but I, I felt like we had them, the beating of them the whole game. And then I could, you know, that, that frustration when I felt like they just squeezed their way back into it. And classic Saris, you know, they're never out of a game. And for us to then, you know, I kind of started feeling real down about it and thinking, oh, they're going to do us, you know, they're going to beat us here again. Uh, but then, you know, Slady's obviously nudged to the corner and then we got on top and the mall scoring that try was just, you know, euphoria. And I think, thinking back to it now, from going uh, from such a high and performing in that semi-final to then perform again in the final was probably one of the biggest things I think that allowed us to win that championship. I think if we'd, it was very easy for us to go, right, big win there. We've beaten Saris. We've done what we wanted to do and then not produced it in the, in the final. And I think that was such a big game. Um, and Saris threw everything they had at us. And we, you know, we, we came out on top and we threw it right back at them. That kick from Slady, to be fair, um, was, I mean, it had to be Slady, didn't it? He was really lovely. Like, I don't, I don't even think, he hadn't done much else all season, but he really banged that in. And it was, um, he then actually, ironically, Stino, he tried to do it again in the final, didn't he? And he kicked it dead. Do you remember? Yeah. So it just shows you what it really was. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, he was... Um, to be fair, he practices, he practices a lot. Yeah, he does. And, and actually, you know, the, uh, I'm with Phil. I mean, I, I remember I'd come off with about 15, 20 to go. And Saris had swung it in their favour. And I was properly head in hand thinking, oh my gosh, they've kind of done it here. And when we got that penalty, there was a glimmer of hope. But then... As, as Henry lines up and he knocks that, and there was the most extraordinary kick. Like he, couldn't, he couldn't have kicked any better. <clears throat> and it shows the plums of him, really, because you're, you're at the death. And, you, you know, the irony is, if he doesn't get it there, we're probably, not, we're probably not scoring that. You know, the fact that he gets it there, you can kind of... And if you watch, you watch the players huddle around Jeff and, um, as they're walking, just you see them raise kind of six inches. And I was like, the whole, as they're walking there, you, I, I kind of felt from the stand, I was like, boom. This is going in. This is absolutely going in. Um, an ex extraordinary moment. Which, that we kind of lent then. It was an <clears throat> amazing kind of scene that Sandy Park was absolutely rocking. Um, what was quite interesting is the attitude back. You know, for a team that really loves to celebrate and enjoy each other's company and have some beers together after a big win, you could see a real genuine steely focus back in the change room um, at the end of the game. Yeah, completely. Which was completely different to the year before when we beat Wasps. I remember we were all in the change room after it and everyone was going crazy thinking this is amazing that we've made the final. You know, and that was, we couldn't have done that without the experience of having the year before. So, um, yeah, there was a real true realisation that we, again, hadn't done anything. All we'd done is make, given ourselves a chance of winning it. Um, and that's all a semi-final is. And I think that is the progression that the club is now at. Where they, you know, we're approaching big games now. Going, there's another one after. Now, obviously, when you get to the final, it's different. You know, it's all on the line. You've got to put everything on the board. Obviously, if we get through these final weeks and you win, celebrate. Yes, by all means. But um, I think semi-finals is now a point now with the clubs. We've established ourselves to know that you've done nothing by getting to a semi. You've done nothing by win, winning a semi. You've got to win finals, and that's where we're at. And that's the. The, the mind shift change that you're talking about earlier. How does the prep compare? Well, obviously, it's, we're again playing Wasps in a final, Stino. How does, how does the prep compare to, to um, uh, three, uh, 20, 2017 in the build-up? Uh, probably, you know, it, it's pretty much the same. Um, you know, uh, our prep is very much approaching every game. We'll get ourselves ready. We'll analyse the opposition. We'll review our previous game and say what we can work on and be better at. Um, the good thing is we, we feel that if we, at this stage, play our game and maximise ourselves, that's the best that gives us the best opportunity of winning any game against any opposition. So um, 
I think the prep wise is it's about really getting yourself emotionally ready. Um, boy, boys, you're, you know you're going to get up for a game. You're obviously going to get up for a final. Um, but it's about uh, pushing the energy in the right direction and making sure when you get to that day that you basically make sure you go and you fire all the shots that you have and um, you give the best to yourself. And if we feel if we give the best to ourselves, it gives us the best chance of winning matches. Phil, 2017 final, you banged in a meat pie. What was that like? That was mega. Um, yeah, God, I, I don't think I ever forget that, really. It was such a, such a great feeling. Um, you know, it's always nice to score a try, but actually, you know, dotting it down. When you're, when you're in the movements and the, the move's going ahead, Devo makes a half break, offloads to me. It's kind of like you just, you're just in the moment, aren't you? You're just trying to do what you do as a rugby player. And then as soon as the ball went down and the noise kicked off, I was like, wow, this is actually something completely different. This is, you know, feeling you never really had before. Um, and it, it's a fantastic feeling. But again, you know, we have to kind of quickly get back on it, get, get our heads back in the game. And as an individual, it's quite hard to do that in those, in those environments. I've never done that before in front of that many people. I've never felt that kind of euphoria. Um, but, you know, it was, it was fantastic. Something, you know, I'll always remember doing. And if I, if I do anything else in rugby, you know, I've always done that. If I do nothing else in rugby, I've always done that. So, you know, the game then goes to extra time. Thank God I was off at that stage because there's no way I had that in me. But um, I remember at the moment, at the time, being really delighted that I, uh, I was thinking, we, the game probably shouldn't have gone to extra time, but in extra time, I was like, right, they're having it. Thank God I'm on the sideline now because I'm gone. Actually, <laughs> gasket's gone. But, um, uh, Stina, what was kind of going through your mind? Because it's, it's, it's a weird, you don't, nec- you don't plan for, for an extra time final ever. No, I think once we got to extra time, I felt that we were the only winners. That's the way I felt because I, if you put yourself in their shoes where they were and the penalty to give away um, right at the end, you know, 90 seconds to go, that's some big mental block to try and come back from. And, um, you know, if that had happened to us, that would have been a massive test to try and get back in. And plus, we felt we were playing well as well. So, um, yes, it, thankfully, it didn't go to penalty kicks because I don't think we were prepped for that in the slightest. You know, I, I dare say we've had this conversation um, a few, like with Ali and stuff, and we actually generally don't know who our three penalty kick, kick takers would have been at the time. So, um, well, you weren't there at the minute, at that time, Kai, and then obviously, Phil, you were off the field. So, I don't know who it was going to be. Maybe Yendel was going to have to step up. But, um, <laughs> he could yeah, be but like, <laughs> exactly. So, look, it just felt we were going to get, I felt to get the extra time was us in the ascendancy. Um, and we pretty much dominated the, the, the extra time. We dominated the territory of the whole thing. And then, thankfully, we got the opportunity. I was hoping we'd score a try. Um, but that never happened. So, um, look, it worked out all right in the end. Just tell us, mate, was because you know I've, I've, I've watched you practice your kicks over and over again, and and it's is it very methodical that you kind of took out the um, took out the environment completely away from the situation away from it. And you just go completely to process because that's what golfers talk a lot about. Is that kind of what you go to? Um, you could easily say that. Let's be honest. That's not true. We're all human. And we were all in the moment. Uh, what happened with me was um, the hardest kick of that game was the one to get at the extra time um, because that is right in front of the post. And I kind of had this mentality about myself was if I miss this one, we are out. We have lost. So, and it was right in front of the post. So you're, you should be kicking that one. Um, that was more pressured kick, I felt. The one that I had to win it was more um, so I could ment- – I did sort of start mentally prepping for it because it was a load of scrums. Uh, I think it ended up being like two minutes of scrummaging. And I kept thinking to myself, there's two things going to happen here. We're going to give a penalty away and Walsh is going to kick the touch. Or we're going to win a penalty and I'm going to have to have a kick here. So it was kind of literally mentally prepping myself for a kick, a goal. Um, and all I was trying to think about was um, literally, this is all right. You've kicked well in the warm-up. You haven't done really well. You haven't missed a kick yet. And um, if I miss it, we'll get another chance to win the game. It's not going to lose the game. It's a chance to win the game. And I kind of try to put a positive spin on it. Um, and, you know, it just seemed to be, 
I was kicking well that day. I was confident about it. So um, the stars aligned, and thankfully I went over the bar. Like, well, I think I think as soon as that penalty went in, Steen, I think I was celebrating because having seen you done it over and over and over again, I was just so confident. You know, with your mental state, you're banging that over. Listen, gents, you've been absolute troopers. What you've done for Exeter Chiefs and the servants you've been is quite extraordinary. Club owes you a great deal, and um, and we look forward to hopefully banging in another victory at the weekend. But I uh, just wanted to wish you all the best. It was a privilege to play with you. And uh, we'll be enjoying many more beers in the future, reminiscing, I hope. <laughs> Glory days. You weren't bad yourself, Kobe. Oh, you yeah, right, yeah. Kobe. You held in well. Don't cut this out, Mike. Jesus. <laughs> 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 all right. Take it easy, man. Cheers, right, mate. Good luck. Good luck. Cheers, boys.